Hi, everybody. My name is Matthew Pose with Pose Acoustics, and we're addressing questions. This one comes from Howard, is it Skeevies? 4184. He provided 999. I think that's euros. Thanks. He says, forgive my, I got it. First thing I want to say, Howard, I think this was written kind of aggressively. And I think that you uh, could have probably answered your own question if you had looked a bit more into this, but I'm going to go ahead and answer it. So you wrote, forgive my ignorance, I'm not an acoustician or any type of engineer or technician. I do, however, have good basic grounding in the sciences, and I do have a logical brain. I note that you and others often talk of time alignment and phase anomalies. I sit 11 feet from my speakers, which are 9 point feet apart. If we work with the speed of sound being 1100 feet per second, then it takes 1 one-hundredth of a second for the direct sound from my speakers to reach my ears. Are you honestly telling me that our auditory system sufficiently acute as to be able to distinguish minuscule time alignment improprieties within one one hundredth of a second to the extent that it notably degrades the audio reproduction? Really? Seriously? I've witnessed Dr. Floyd Tool express an opposing opinion. Your comments welcomed. Okay. So Howard, here's the issue. You're assuming that the only sources of delay in a subwoofer is the actual difference in distance, but that's not correct. So remember, filters cause delay. Filters cause group delay, and so as you go lower in frequency, that delay typically increases more and more and more. When you put a subwoofer into a system, its own filters, even if they're analog, are going to cause delay, meaning that subwoofer is going to be perceived as farther away from you than it really is as a result of that delay. And that delay is way more than hundredths of a second, um, or one one hundredth of a second, as you put it. So typically, what we see, also remember that at 100 hertz, one full cycle of delay which is audible, is 10 milliseconds. Now, what we typically see is that these systems are off by more than 10 milliseconds. When you plug in the subwoofer, it's typically off by 20 milliseconds, 30 milliseconds, something like that. And so the time alignment we're trying to get it to is within one cycle. But you want to get the phase alignment right too, and the two are tied together. So the best way to do that is to get the phase right and the timing right. Again, they're interconnected to be as close to zero as possible. I'm not suggesting that if the system is at uh, one millisecond off, you can hear that. I'm not even suggesting you could hear 10 milliseconds off. I doubt very much you could. What I'm saying is that you can hear 20 plus milliseconds off, and that's how far off they often are. Now, digital DSP often creates even higher degrees of latency. And in some cases, the chain of the signal path can introduce as much as way more than that, like over 100 milliseconds. That's what it is we're trying to compensate for. We're trying to get it down to below 10 milliseconds. And those are the measurable delays that you can actually see in many systems that we're trying to deal with. So that's the issue. Um, it, as to what the science says to what we can hear, the science actually varies. We are very good at hearing timing differences. And some of what Floyd has said oversimplifies it because there's more recent research that's come out that seems to suggest we can hear smaller time differences. The problem is the circumstances under which that was true, which is why what Floyd tr says is ultimately true, um, were conditions that are not realistic to the real world. So putting somebody into a, a very quiet environment with very, very specific contrived test tones over headphones, they can get you to a point of being able to detect these very small timing differences. You then play it back over speakers in a real room with real reflections, and that goes away. Um, and actually, most of the research was never done that way. Uh, the older research was, but a lot of the more recent stuff has stuck with headphones trying to figure out the, the lower limit. So, I, like I said, I'm not suggesting you can hear these tiny, tiny differences. What I'm suggesting is that the differences are bigger than you realize. The differences are actually quite large, and that is what it is we need to get right. So, I did another video like a second ago. I don't know how the order of these are going to post. Probably that one will post first and then this one, but Basically, what happens is you hook up your subwoofer, you hook up your main speakers, and you don't do anything to them at all. You just leave them alone, and you play back your music. Uh, I'm sorry, you play back your test tones, and you, and you take your sweep or whatever, you do your measurement, and you're going to see that there's like a, either a, a peak, although almost, there almost never is. It's almost always the opposite, or a dip around this crossover point. That's caused by the phase misalignment. Remember that timing and phase are intertwined, and the phase misalignment is actually caused by a timing misalignment. So you then look at the timing of the system and you realize, oh, for whatever reason, the subwoofer is coming in after the main speakers at that crossover point. How much? There's different ways to look at that. I use wavelets. So using the peak energy curve and the wavelet, I see that it's coming in 
25 milliseconds later. I re-time align these so that they no longer are 25 milliseconds off. And then what happens is the peak time curve shows a nice uh, progression through the crossover point that doesn't change in timing much. It's nice and smooth. And the frequency response no longer shows that dip. That dip is what I'm concerned about. And you might argue there's other ways to fix it. In fact, most people apply other ways to fix it. But I think those are wrong. Because when you do get the timing off and you introduce artificial group delay into the system that isn't a couple of milliseconds, it's actually quite large. As I said, we're talking typically a couple of cycles. And I have seen on multiple occasions 10 cycles. That kind of group delay is audible. And the research on group delay absolutely had shown that to be true. In fact, Floyd was, I believe, a co-author on one of the papers that looked at group delay in systems. And the conclusion was low frequency group delay is audible, but it's inevitable. And so making a really big deal about removing it isn't worth it. Here's the thing. That was done a long time ago. And many of the sources of inev an inevitable, there we go, group delay have been eliminated or minimized in today's system. So group delay is not as bad today in the recording signal path as it used to be because many of the systems now use things like DC servo outputs. Um, they don't typically use DC servo inputs. So most mics preamps, for instance, still have um, uh, a capacitor in them that would create a uh, some group delay and a, and a low frequency high pass on it. But they are lower than they used to be. So they used to be like minus 3 dB at, let's say, 20 hertz. Now it's not uncommon to be minus 3 dB at like 10 hertz, um, uh, sometimes even lower than that. And think about how much music isn't even real anymore in the sense that it's not like a microphone recording. It's actually completely digital. Those digital recordings, other than the filters effects themselves, have no group delay from that. So a lot of recordings today don't have the inherent group delay that they did back then. And then you've got the systems themselves where, again, what I'm describing, like it used to be that they were finding maybe half of one or one cycle of group delay that was being accumulated at low frequencies, maybe two. That was it, and that was considered enough to be audible. But I'm seeing 10 cycles of group delay that's being introduced into these systems due to alignment problems. So when I get into like integrating things right and saying, don't just look at phase, look at time alignment, that's what I'm talking about. You know, Like, like I said, I'm trying to get this down to a cycle or less. And then making sure that the frequency response is really, really good through that integration zone. Having shown other people this method, lots of people, including lots of PhD acousticians, and having them listen between different presets that were done with the system time aligned versus not, what we have found very consistently is positive responses to this approach that I use, with many saying there seems to be something to it. Now, obviously, the Harmon way, the next step would be to do blind testing listening to a system that's phase aligned but still a cycle or two off versus one that is time aligned as a result also phase aligned and is, is, is not a cycle or two off and seeing the degree to which the cycles off become audible versus not. At some point it will be. At what point I don't know. But one of the things we often see which I think is probably the more important factor here is that when I do get that time alignment right I also am getting the frequency response to be better through that integration zone and, uh, and so overall, the amplitude response is improved as well as the time alignment. But um, like I said, we know group delay is audible. It's not the most audible effect, but it is audible. Like to just completely ignore it, I think belies what we know about it. And if you've gotten everything else right, you've got really good subwoofers, you've got good acoustics in the room, you've got speakers placed the way they should be, and everything's been set up right, it doesn't cost money to fix group delay. And so if you've got a number of cycles of delay in there at low frequencies that are rising, which is the effect that group delay would have, then it's very likely that the audible effects of group delay would be there as well, which I've seen noted as a sort of fuzzy effect to the bass. And so if you fix it, which costs nothing, should make the bass sound less fuzzy, to use the term that was used in this paper I'd read. Um, and that seems like a good thing. I don't see a problem with that. So I hope that's helpful. Um, and then as I said, I think that the way this was written could have been written differently um, to have gotten the same response, but I'm happy to respond to it anyway. So thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks for watching. Like these videos, subscribe. Donations are always appreciated. And uh, I think this is a topic we've covered a number of times before and obviously is raising some interest. And I would uh, like to probably do more and more of these uh, to delve into it. So maybe 
need to think about this. Maybe I'll do another video where I delve more into the science of this uh, to help explain it. Group delay is something that I've, there's some people who, uh, Ed Mullins is one actually, and then James Larson as well, where we've debated this because both of them feel that it's not a particularly important factor. And when I've gotten into more deep conversations with them about it, the, the sort of end conclusion, it isn't that they think it like doesn't matter at all. It's that they think that like, if you look at the hierarchy of problems, most people's problems are so much greater than the effect of group delay that to be focusing on group delay at all it's just a waste of energy when they should be focusing on other stuff. But in this case, I think Ed would agree with me that we're actually trying to fix the same thing that he thinks is so important. He thinks that subwoofer integration to the mains is super critical, that it's one of the most important things to getting a system to sound right. And there's so many folks I know, people who have really good ears and are really smart folks who will tell me they don't like subwoofers because when they hear a full range speaker versus a speaker with subwoofers, they always find the full range speaker sounds better in the bass than the subwoofer. It is my opinion that that is not because full-range speakers sound better than speakers with subwoofers. To me, that makes no scientific or logical sense. It's that the, they, they have had trouble hearing a system with subwoofers properly integrated into the mains, which I do think is actually very difficult to do. But done correctly, I believe that actually should and would yield a superior result. And I think part of the key to proper integration and getting the things that we all care about right, like the amplitude response, and the phase response at that area relates to timing. So I hope that's helpful. Thanks, everybody.